Okay. So uh, the reason this has been, uh, you know, uh, drawing attention is because uh, we have seen extremely successful performance on large uh, practical language uh, related problems. So, for example, uh, transformer has been extremely successful in uh, machine transmission. Okay. In fact, I remember in uh, 2016, suddenly there was this uh, news that uh, Google has transferred all its uh, machine transmission machinery from statistical to neural. Okay. So, uh, the reason it became so is because of the success of transformer. Now, transformer is actually uh, RNN with uh, self-attention and positional encoding. So we can say transformer is RNN plus uh, attention plus uh, positional encoding. This was extremely successful in machine transmission and any kind of uh, natural language generation problems like summarization, question answering, everywhere it could uh, prove uh, its own, uh, its uh, power. So that's why it became uh, a very important machinery. But it is little interesting that the uh, understanding of transformer as to why it works came later. Okay, the analysis was post facto. After seeing that this machine is doing so well, there was continuous analysis of what exactly is going on inside. Okay, so there uh, it was understood that uh, self attention plays a very important role and also positional encoding. So, both these mechanisms, both these mechanisms we have to. Uh, understand well. So before that, a one slide recap what we did before MITSEM. And uh, there the main attention was on uh, encoder and decoder. So this is also a machine transfer situation where we see that the input sentence says, I read the book and uh, the translation is Mane Kitab Pari. Okay. So what happens is that the encoder processes the input uh, the sentence, uh, one input at a time, and we finally have a vectorial representation of the whole sentence going into an RNN. So all these are copies of the same RNN, as you know. Okay. So the the one RNN, uh, it could be LSTM, GRU, whatever, but a fundamentally an RNN, which takes that vector and begins to output the target language. Uh, so the sentence words. So there are many things which are done automatically and uh, we don't have to worry about them unlike in statistical machine translation where we have to establish an alignment from I to ma. Ne is a postposition which uh, just gets produced. Ne does not correspond to anything inside the English sentence. Okay. And then read uh, padi. Okay, you see the second word has become the fourth word here. The doesn't correspond to anything in uh, the Hindi sentence. Ne in Hindi sentence doesn't correspond to anything in English sentence. Okay, so similarly, the doesn't correspond to anything in the Hindi sentence. Uh, book is uh, kitab. So the last word in the English sentence occupies the third position in the Hindi sentence. Okay. And that is happening because the two languages have a different syntax. Okay, their word ordering is different. Now, pre neural machine transition day, when it was statistical machine transmission, a very large part of the activity <laughs> would be in establishing uh, correspondences. Okay, so I and ma, then, uh, uh, then read to padi and so on. Okay, so this is this problem is this is called alignment. So a large part of machine transition activity concentrated on how to establish the alignment. Now here it would make sense for you to think that I gets aligned to my ne. Another point of view could be ne is not ne is not aligned to anything. So there is a to token fictitious token called null, and if both the uh, both target and source sentences have something called null token. So, <coughs> ne corresponds to null token in the source sentence and the corresponds to null token in the target sentence. Okay. So, working with null 
proved to be uh, cumbersome. Okay, so just like in uh, non-deterministic finite state machines, epsilon transitions are good for expression, but okay, epsilon transitions are difficult to deal with. Okay, implementation wise, it is difficult to deal with. So you can propose that I actually uh, maps to many together. Okay, so this is uh, phrase to phrase machine transmission, Fra phrase to phrase alignment. And phrase to phrase alignment has been extremely successful, but the bottom line is uh, word to word alignment. When we go to speech, it becomes a little more complicated. In speech, the signals are continuous. Okay, in uh, uh, text, you have word boundaries. So the text is naturally broken up into tokens, which is I read the book. But there are languages in world. For example, Thai doesn't have any word boundary. The word boundary has to be deciphered from the context, okay, which is an ad additional difficulty. So I should map to uh, my ni together. Similarly, Kitab should map to the book. Okay? So we have here phrase to phrase alignment. Now the beauty of neural machine translation is that you don't have to do this th do these things explicitly at all okay you just take the sentence the sentence becomes a vector magically and that vector is sufficient to pass through another rnn and uh, very interestingly one after another word comes out okay uh, uh, which is uh, triggered by the parameters inside the rnn too good to believe no too good to believe that all these semantics, syntax, morphology, the lemma, all these will get enca encapsulated in one vector. Hmm? Too good to believe. So that's a tremendous abstraction. And it was understood that no, we need some uh, language properties to be uh, modeled in the machine. Okay. Now that modeling, let me give you an abstract view of that modeling. So that modeling is based on the fact that the words have differential attention. So let's first understand cross attention. Okay, I'm actually jumping the gun. This is one slide recap, but this diagram is helpful for me. So last, uh, before midsem, what we did was we did A star algorithm, B B and beam search in the context of decoding. This is called decoding. One vector goes into the RNN and, uh, we, uh, and, and gets transformed into a sequence of words in the target language. This is called decoding, yeah. You will get the Hindi sentence. Yeah, yeah, right. So in goes the English sentence, out comes the Hindi sentence, okay. So then, uh, so, so, so this decoding is actually a search problem because at this instant of time, I have my as an output, but this my is chosen from amongst many different options. The whole vocabulary, in fact, is available for me to output, except that uh, most of the words in the vocabulary have extremely low probability of output, close to zero probability. That's why they don't come out. Okay, so a scoring function uh, is applied to create one, one word after another. Now, cross attention is uh, more easy to understand. Kitab must give a lot of attention to book. Okay, so Kitab is uh, most influenced by the presence of the word book here. Okay, and uh, no word in the Hindi sentence is influenced by the. Okay. Ne is not uh, produced because of any particular word, but a combined influence of the uh, uh, syntax and semantics here. What produces ne? What is responsible to produce ne? Anybody? Native speakers of Hindi? Huh? So abstractly? Ne is produced when the verb is in past tense. May ne kitab partahu no. First point is that the verb is in past tense. 
and the verb has to be transitive. Okay, sakarma kriya, it must get an object. You do not say maine soya, or you say, do you say maine soya? No, maine soya. Okay, so sona or sleep is an intransitive verb. So, uh, so the, the, the nice thing is that this machine has ingested a syntactic uh, rule that the verb has to be in past tense and it must be a, a transitive verb. If you were writing a rule-based machine transfer system, you will encode this rule. Yeah. Ha, huh, yes. Okay, I, I read the book. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I read the book. How come it has produced many kitab para? How did it know that uh, this read is not read? Uh, it's not read, but read. How did it know? No, it is just an example, okay? So it can very well produce my uh, kitab parta hu. It can very well produce that. This is only by way, by way of an example. Now, yeah, that brings another question that out of those two options, which one, will be, which one will be produced? The one which occurs more frequently in the training data. That's it. My par raha who will become I am reading. Yeah, so so this is, uh, so we see the influence of uh, cross attention. Kitab is most influ influenced by book and not, uh, and not so much by other words. Okay, so that's a very, very important point. And then, uh, ne is influenced by uh, uh, re uh, read, okay? And also the fact that there is book, okay? Ne, the generation of ne look, looks simple, but it's actually a very complex machinery, okay? Ne is influenced by the read verb and also the object of the read verb, which is book. So you can see that, you know, so much of complexity is just brushed under the carpet uh, by uh, deep learning system, okay? All it demands is that, okay, uh, this linguistic complexity, I don't care. Just give me a huge amount of data and I'll give you the correct output. Okay, but only taking a single vector from the sentence and passing it to the decoder ran into problem because of long sentences, very soon. So cross attention you have understood at least at the top level. Self attention is little more interesting and complex. Okay, so this comes from a very old theory, linguistic theory called akanksha, okay, expectation. This comes from the Indian linguistics tradition, you also see them in Western linguistic tradition, okay, argument and adjunct. So uh, what happens is uh, read has the property that it, whenever it appears in the sentence, it needs an agent who reads. And what do you read? The book or the letter. So the object also needs to be present, okay? So these are called semantic roles and read has a semantic role expectation for I and book. The, which is a determiner, has an expectation for a noun or a noun phrase, okay? So those kind of expectations are uh, inherent in the construction of the sentence. Otherwise, the sentence does not get formed, okay? So those rules operate in our mind. Now, self-attention is the preferential attention of a word for another word in the sentence. Preferential attention, okay? So, read gives a lot of attention to I, its agent, and to its object, book. Not so much to the. Okay? So, this is uh, the notion of self-attention, the notion of cross-attention. Now comes the question of, okay, we understand the phenomenon. We understand influences and so on. How do we model them? How do we model them? Okay. So here comes a very important uh, notion, which uh, is that neural networks are, layered neural networks are end-to-end -end systems. Okay. So when you uh, decrease the loss function at the uppermost layer, lots of error correction happens in the lower layers. Okay, a lot of error correction happens in the lower layer. So, 
let me take a small example. So we have an input sentence and we are creating the parse tree for the sentence. So, uh, so we, uh, we create a parse tree from a sentence. So let me draw the sentence S goes to NP VP. Okay, so those of you who did the last course on NLP, you know that these kind of structures are created. And uh, they get created based on what is called the part of speech. So boys are noun, play is a verb, and these uh, part of speech tags are signals that I have a noun phrase here and a verb phrase here. They can be combined to get a sentence. So uh, suppose I am not satisfied with the parsing performance because there are lots of erroneous parse trees. So what I decide is that I'll first do part, uh, part of switch tagging <coughs> for the input sentence and then get the parsing. Now we have training data. So the input sentence and their corresponding parse trees appear at the last layer. And there you have a loss function, okay? now. You don't have to worry about the loss function for uh, part of speech. If you minimize the loss at the outermost layer for parsing, automatically the uh, error for pause tagging also will get corrected. Okay, only you will have to introduce a small neural network for part of speech tagging. And use that part of speech tagging module to feed into the parsing also. So this diagram will be changed. This diagram will be changed to say that uh, I will send input to pause tagger. So pause tagger will feed its output to higher layers. And the input sentence also let it go into the uh, other layers in the neural network, okay? So uh, this is a fit for our network, fit for our network. This is another, let's say fit for our network and another module up here, layer wise. So the nice thing is that if you uh, begin back propagating from here, the back propagation will flow through this network and change the parameters here. It will also flow through here, okay? And these parameters will change to give you good part of speech tagging. What you minimize in the loss is for part parsing. There is no explicit loss minimization for pause, but it happens because of back propagation. Back propagation can flow through any network, any architecture. Is this point clear? Because this is what is done in uh, cross attention, self attention, attention network also. Yeah. What are we getting names in the normal neural network only? Ask it again. In the upper part of speech, you are sending it to names. In the names, a normal neural network only, they have. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This is an ordinary neural network. For simplicity, let us assume it is a a fit forward network. So there are neurons and connections for the neurons going forward, going upward finally to a output layer where the parsing is produced. If you are not, if you do not want to think about parsing, think, think about this as let's say named entity recognition or anything which transforms one sequence to another. And the loss function is available here. The loss is not available here. 
doesn't matter. Back propagation will take care of this. Okay. So similarly, uh, the attention network, I don't have to do anything. I have to introduce another uh, uh, layer of neurons and say that you do the job of capturing or modeling the self-attention or mutual attention between the words in the input sentence. Another module, which is cross-attention, will take care of modeling the special attention given by target words to the source words. And all this can be arranged by fit forward networks, through which backpropagation flows. Okay, so this, this uh, depiction is important. I can make it a little more abstract. Introduce an actual auxiliary task. Open a uh, sub branch connected with the main branch. So attention also happens this way. Okay, so input sentence becomes uh, input source sentence becomes target language sentence. In between, introduce a, a, an attention module and train it through backpropagation. Okay, that is the basic idea. Of course, now gradually the details will be evolved. Okay, now long distance dependency is a reality. We saw this example before. Uh, bank is an ambiguous word, but uh, the clue for bank comes from the word immersion and river, uh, quite uh, far off from the word bank within the sentence. Okay, now uh, if the task is WSD, if the main task is words and disambiguation, and if there is an attention layer interposed between uh, classification layer, words and disambiguation is classification, and the input sentence, then we'll see that the attention of bank to immersion and river is really high compared to other pairs. Okay. So if the entire source sentence is represented by a single ve vector, there are pr different problems. Insufficient to represent, uh, to capture all the syntactic and semantic complexities. So uh, one solution could be use a richer representation for the sentence. Okay, not a uh, raw sequence of words, but maybe you embellish this with part of speech tagging information named entity information, and so on and so forth. Long-term dependencies. Source sentence representation not useful after a few decoder time steps. Make source sentence information uh, when making the uh, next prediction. So even better, make relevant source sentence information available. So make source sentence information available when making the text prediction. Even better, make relevant source sentence information available. So source sentence information, of course, is becoming a vector and it is available to the decoder. So uh, this gave rise to what is called the encode, attend, decode paradigm. And uh, if you have this sentence here, I read the book, then uh, the source sentence, of course, is represented by a set of uh, vectors, okay, set of vectors. And then there is an additional layer of neurons which, which, which create what is called the attention vector, okay? How uh, at the attention vector looks, what is its dimension? Those details we'll uh, look into as we go ahead. And this was a very uh, seminal paper from ICLR 2015 due to Bahadanu and other authors, neural machine translation by jointly learning to align and translate. So this is a very, very fundamental paper which introduced attention for the first time over encode and decode uh, framework, okay? So this is really a must read for 
any student of deep learning or NLP. Okay, so the transformer essential is uh, captured according to me by this equation, transformer equal to RNN plus attention plus positional encoding. So normally, uh, 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 attention is covered first and then positional encoding, but there is a very nice intuitive uh, concept behind positional encoding. So I'll first do positional encoding, okay? So this that intuition is very nice to look at. Now, the transformer is a structure which is founded on two pillars. The first pillar is attention. The second pillar is positional encoding. Okay. So this is the uh, classic transformer diagram from uh, this paper. Uh, this, uh, this, this, this is by Vaswani et al. Attention is all you need. Probably the most famous paper in deep learning for NLP. And we have uh, structures of this kind. So let me introduce terminology here. We have the input em embedding, then there is multi, multi head attention, then adding and normalization, then there is a fit forward network, again adding and normalization, and so on. This is the encoding side. In the decoding side, also we have multi masked multi head attention, then again multi head attention, fit forward network, there is a linear layer, then finally a softmax layer. And there is a block for adding and normalizing. Okay, so all these blocks we would like to look at for, from the both for, from the point of view of uh, language properties and implementation. Okay, this is probably the most famous uh, diagram in deep learning for NLP and the most famous paper. So attention is uh, first covered typically, but I would like to first cover positional encoding because there is a very uh, nice insight, insight for positional encoding, which is not covered in the papers and books. The encoder decoder RNN generates a sequence of hidden states HT, T varying from zero to L, where L is the sentence length. And each HT is a function of the previous hidden state HT minus one and the input at position T. So this is what we had seen in encoder decoder network. So to process the input at tth step, the encoder decoder has to wait for t minus one steps. This sequential nature of RNN makes the training time very large. So now uh, comes the main uh, discussion on positional encoding. So we can look up on the, the sentence to be a stage and all the words and punctuations are players on that stage. Okay, so this helps us understand the uh, relative importance of the words and the mutual pairwise importance also. So if I take this sentence, children saw a big lion in the zoo in the morning. The most important entity in the sentence, uh, okay, from uh, the point of view of semantics is the main verb saw, okay. Then we come to the next most important entity, the agent of the activity. Here it is children. What did they see? Lion, which is the object. Where? In the zoo and when? In the evening. Okay. So uh, who, what, where, when? These are called the factoid uh, signals. Okay. They answer factoid questions whose answers are typically one word or one phrase. They have to be contrasted from why and how, okay? So I look up on the whole sentence as a stage where the main uh, part is played by the main verb and the uh, noun phrases are linked with the main verb through different semantic relations. Now, there is this notion of position sensitivity, especially for languages which are morphologically weak, okay? They do not encode information in the positions. So we have this kind of linguistic rule. If the main verb is, a tr is transitive and is in past tense, then the noun phrase to the left of the main verb should get ne, the postposition mark, and the noun phrase to the right of the uh, main verb will get the postposition marker ko, which is uh, the translation from English to Hindi. And 
the main uh, and the noun phrase to the left of the main verb is typically the agent. Noun phrase to the right is typically the object. So this uh, information is encoded in the relative position. Okay, so we do not have any case marker, ne, co, etc. It is the position which encodes that information. Now, uh, transformer's major contribution is uh, positional encoding because the attention was proposed before. Attention came in 2015, right, from Bahada newspaper. What uh, Vaswani et al. Uh, added is the notion of positional encoding, okay, to increase the effectiveness of NLP further, to make the quality of machine translation better, the translation training time should be reduced. With all these points of view, they introduced positional encoding. So what position is an additional disambiguation signal? If I have doubt about who is the agent, who is the object, then I disambiguate by looking at the relative position. Okay, is it to the left of the verb or the right of the verb? That, that is the disambiguation done. Words influence one another by virtue of their properties and positions. Both are used, property and position. How do you uh, encode the properties of a word? Position is there. Okay, how do you encode the property? You have done it in the course. Hmm? Word embedding or word vector, yeah. They encode the properties of the word, okay. So uh, property of the word plus the position of the word. Note these two points. Property of the word plus the position of the word. And indeed, in transformers, we take the word vector, we take the position vector and add them component wise. That's what we do in the transformers. Okay, so don't you see that the linguistic intuition gets implemented by the mathematical operation of addition, component-wise addition, right? So words influence one another by virtue of their properties, namely word embeddings, and their positions, their position vectors. That is all. Okay, such influences manifest in translations as morphological transformation, lexical choice, pragmatic markers, and so on and so forth. The tenet of mach machine learning based NLP is that with sufficient data, all these mutual influences can be learned. Okay, so now you have introduced the position vector, we have introduced the word attention. Now take the very basic question of how do I rank the pairwise pairwise influence of the words? Yeah. Yeah. So that is another point we need to discuss. I mean, this is another possibility. Okay. But uh, empirically found that uh, concatenating another uh, vector, which is position vector, increases the input size. This is a very natural question to ask, yes. But apparently adding position vectors is position vector component wise to the word vector does not uh, does not uh, harm. And in fact, the concatenation does not produce better result than just addition. There is another point. The another point is that the position vector and the word vector, if you add them, you get a resultant vector. Okay, so that resultant vector uh, what, what does the resultant vector do? It uh, changes the orientation and the position of the word vector, no? And it bring, brings uh, semantically closer entities, closer in the geometric space also. Okay, so positions are encoded as embeddings and positional embeddings are supplied along with the input word embeddings. The training phase teaches the transformer to condition the output by paying attention to not only the input words, but also their positions, okay? So everything is now uh, transferred to the shoulder of training. Positional vectors and word vectors, both are uh, used to train the transformer to condition the output by paying attention to not only the input word, 
but also the positions. Okay. Now uh, we find in the Vaswani paper and also you know related literature some strange formula. The positional uh, embedding is captured by means of sine and cos functions. So one question students most of the time ask is why sine and cos? Okay, sine and cos are periodic functions. Why do you bring in periodicity? Where does period, periodicity play a role? So here we come to something very interesting and intuitive. First, we make this foundational observation number one. Let S be a set of symbols and let P be a set of patterns the symbols create. If the number of patterns is more than the uh, number of symbols, then isn't it obvious that there must exist patterns P that have repeated symbols? It has to happen, no? If the building blocks is smaller in number, then the larger entities which are used by these building blocks, then the building blocks have to repeat. What else? Okay. So this foundational observation number one, if S is a set of symbols, P is a set of patterns, and if P is greater than S, cardinal to P is greater than cardinal to S, then symbols from S must repeat in, in P. Next. If the patterns can be arranged in series with equal difference of values between every consecutive pair, then at any given position, the symbols at different positions of the pattern strings must repeat, uh, must repeat, okay, uh, with a periodicity. So suppose we have 10 symbols, which are called digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9. In the sorted list of integers in ascending order, the string length of the integer goes on increasing. Isn't it? So you have only 10 symbols and the numbers are increasing in magnitude. What will happen? The length of the strings have to increase. What else can you do? If the magnitude of the numbers is increasing, it must be manifested somewhere. So it gets manifested in the string length increasing. Larger numbers have longer length, typically. In the sorted list of integers in ascending order, the string length, okay. And the digits repeat after every 10 numbers. In the lowest significant position, after every 100 numbers in the next lowest position, and after every 1000 numbers in the next to next lowest position and so on. So if you can arrange the uh, patterns in some kind of order, then the symbols will also repeat with a periodicity. Okay, so zero to nine, when will the nine, number nine come again? <coughs> when you have arranged the integers in ascending order consecutively, when will number nine come again? After 10 numbers, isn't it? After 10 numbers. In the second, uh, in the uh, second position, second to the left, okay, the numbers will repeat after 100. So, so, so all I'm saying is that, first of all, the, uh, uh, the building blocks will repeat and they will repeat with a periodicity. So take binary numbers, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on. So if you take this lowest significant bit, then it has the highest frequency, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on. And then in the second most significant digit position, you have 0, 0, then 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on. The frequency has become half. and then the third most significant position, the frequency is still half. So it is one fourth, fourth of the frequency of the lowest position. So if periodicity is involved, then what is the most uh, natural periodic function we invoke? We think of sine and cos, sine function. Sine function is periodic, okay? 
So, challenges in designing positional encodings, we cannot append decimal integers as position values. Words later in the sequence will dominate by the force of their positions being large integers. We cannot normalize them. Word relations uh, changing with the length of sentence is linguistically untenable. For example, if you take the sentence, oh, what a beautiful day, which expresses delight, the nature of the day being beautiful, O being an exclamatory prefix to the rest of the phrase and so on, it should be invariant with respect to the sentence length. Okay? Oh, what a beautiful day, if it is a part of a longer sentence, the meaning of this part does not change because the length has increased. Okay? So, we are toying with different options to design the positional encoding. Positional encoding and attention are the two uh, pillars of transformer. So, these two let us try to uh, get into as much of depth, depth as possible. Binary values also do not do. Zeros will contribute nothing and ones will influence completely. So, such a black and white hard decisions go against the grain of NLP whose other name is ambiguity. You represent uh, NLP structures by means of probability. A language object represented by a ve vector must allow soft choices in its components, preferably represented by values in the close range of 0 to 1. Okay? And uh, the criteria that positional encoding should satisfy are should be added component by component to the word vector. Components should range from 0 to 1, both included. Components should be periodic since they represent consecutive integers and it was ingenious on the part of the creators of transformers to spot that sine and cosine functions meet the above requirements. Okay. So, uh, let me then try to uh, sort of simplify and summarize what is being said. So, I have this, uh, I have this sentence, let us say, oh, what a beautiful day. I have the word vector of O, word vector of comma, what a beautiful day, exclamation, all these word vectors I have, token vectors. I also want to capture by a vector the uh, positions of these words. I need them for uh, linguistic uh, phenomenon to be modeled. I need the positions of the words, period. So, I could have uh, started by saying, okay, this is 0, take a binary number, 0, 0, 0, let us say n bits, so zero, all zeros. I take uh, beautiful, then the uh, lowest significant position has 1, everything else is 0. A, second position, the second most significant position is 1, everything else 0, and so on. Notice that day because its position vector is 0, 0, 0, n bits, contributes nothing to the computation. Contributes nothing. It does not change the word vector at all. Word vector of day is word vector. The position vector addition has not changed anything. Okay? So, this is not a desirable situation. I take beautiful, there is one bit which is 1. That is adding something, others contribute nothing. So, zeros and ones will not do. I need something else. Okay? So, that is why, and we will detail this out later, that is why we, uh, they have used a formula of this kind. Position number uh, T, T, 2i, etc. we will look at later. The position is encoded by means of a sign function and the argument is also quite complicated why they are so not everything is detailed out in the paper we can make some guesses and some explanations from the paper itself uh, do do read Vaswani et al's paper before the next class we can have a little more in depth discussion so it is clear that i need uh, some function other than binary representation and they have used sign and cos. Of course, there are many other variation of positional encoding. 
it is not only sine and cos okay they also have been used so uh, sine and cos is used to capture the periodicity and periodicity is inevitable even if you take binary representations there is periodicity of the bits okay so we will uh, discuss this in more detail we will spend considerable amount of time on the transformer okay so am i am i audible at the back back Okay, so let us take this sentence. Uh, we are given a uh, posted corpus and uh, we have to produce uh, noun chunks. We have to produce chunks on this, and the condition that is given is that noun chunks are determiner, any number of adjectives, and a noun. And uh, the noun chunks can be uh, such that everything can be dropped except the noun. Okay, so boys play has has two chunks in the sentence. Boys is one chunk, and uh, plays is the other chunk. So there will be uh, there will be two ones here, one on boys and plays also has a one. Okay, but little boys play there uh, the chunk will be 1, 0 and then 1, okay. This is how it should operate. Now let us see, uh, now what is our first uh, reaction? First reaction could be that uh, how can a, a single perceptron do this job, okay. A single perceptron has only two states. 0 and 1. And of course, the input to the perceptron is in our hand, right? So, uh, so we think that uh, maybe it is not possible and initially I thought, yeah, it may not be possible. But uh, the point is that uh, the perceptron can have a context available to it. And of course, when it is a recurrent perceptron, it has also memory. We distinguish between context and memory. The state is the memory and the context is the set of words coming before. Now, this particular uh, problem has a number of very nice nuances, okay, which I would like you to note. And uh, also, by the way, this problem will become your second assignment, okay. You will have to use a single recurrent perceptron, but in this case the perceptron will be a sigmoid perceptron because you have to run back propagation on this and the algorithm to be used will be BPTT, back propagation through time, okay. So, uh, so, so this, this question is your next assignment also. Now let us see, uh, perceptrons we know have this property that they have a threshold theta and a weight vector w and an input vector x. Okay. And if w dot x is greater than theta, output y is equal to 1 less than or equal to theta y is equal to 0. We would like to work with uh, only greater than or greater than and less than. So, I would like to remove equal to. So, this is all I have. Now, what I do is that I take a simple perceptron with uh, threshold 0.5 and one hot representation for the four parts of speech, okay. If it is recurrent, then you will have a connection coming back. This weight is 1, theta is 0.5 and all these weights are 1, 
dt for this connection, jj for this, nn for this, and others for the other connection. So, if, if an important initial step is to decide to use one hot representation, that simplifies a lot of things. So, this uh, perceptron can it uh, do my job? Okay, I have let's say the boy plays. And I find that the part of speech tag is dt, nn, and vb. Okay, so this is my part of speech tag. And what should be the chunking? The chunking output should be 1, 0, and 1. The boy plays. 1, 0, and 1. So, 1, 0 indicates a one noun chunk and another chunk is with VB. Okay. So, initially DT, this line becomes on. This one hot representation. This line becomes on. So, 1 into 1, more than 0 0.5. Output indeed will be 1. That is okay. Next, the NN line will be on, other lines are 0. Okay? And since the previous output was 1, a 1 will come over this feedback connection also. So, 1 into 1 is 1, and 1 into 1 is 1, 1 plus 1, 2, 2 more than 0. 0.5, boy gets a level of 1. That is wrong. Okay, this should have been 0. So, what I do is that I have 1 coming here. So, I make this connection. These connection weights are in my hand. Okay, and I am not running any data driven machine learning algorithm. I am assigning the weights. This is called model driven approach. In my mind, I have a model of the task. And according to that, I specify the weights. So I've given, let's say, if I give a minus, uh, if I give a minus two here, then this will do the job. Okay. Now one will come here on noun uh, line, and uh, minus two, plus minus why minus two? In fact, minus one will also do. Minus one will do. So minus one and plus one will be zero. Zero less than 0 0.5, output will be zero. This is okay. Okay, right? Huh? No, the and boy is a chunk. No, no, I'm discussing this sentence. No. Okay, not the sentence on the screen. The boy plays. That's all. Okay. So if I have a minus one here, boy will get a zero. So one zero first chunk. Now I come to VB. VB is actually OT. <coughs> VB is OT. So here I should get a one. And I think I'll get one because. The previous out output was 0, 0 into 1 is 0. And if I make uh, OT connection as 1, I will get a 1 here. So it is working for this. What about, uh, so I have fixed my network now, okay. This is 1, this is minus 1, this is 1, this is 1. Now I take this sentence. Now I take boy's play. Boy's play. So initially, 
there is no uh, feedback uh, activation. So this is zero. Boys is now. So this this line will be one. All others are zero. Now um, I'm getting zero into one zero, and one into minus one minus one minus one less than point five. I'll get a level zero here, which is wrong. Okay, so this is wrong. What should I do? I propose that uh, there is a sentence beginner at. So those of you who did pause tagging know that there is a special tag called hat, which is the at the beginning of a sentence. So now instead of a uh, four bit one hot representation, I'll have a five bit one hot representation. So initially, the head will be on hat, and I have not fixed the weight, and no weight has been fixed here. So let's say I say that the weight is um, let's say the weight is minus one. Okay, then I'll get a zero here which is subject to interpretation. It can be one, zero, anything. Okay, it doesn't matter. Now I come to boys. So boys has, again, all zeros, okay, all zeros, except NN is one. And uh, there I had already fixed a minus one. Doesn't serve my purpose. Okay, doesn't serve my purpose. So what does it suggest? It suggests that I uh, look at the current word, but I also look at the previous word. OK, so instead of the one hot representation of the current word only coming into the perceptron, I take the one hot representation of the previous word also, but that will be a five bit one hot representation. Okay, the network will be a perceptron with uh, five plus four, nine inputs. Four bits for one hot representation of the current word, which is getting the tag one or zero, and four bits for the previous word, and also an additional line indicating the beginning of the sentence. That will be used only once, only for the first word. Okay. So if we do that, then uh, by trial and error, we can, you know, fix the weight values. But we have to take a more systematic approach. So this will be my network. Actually, let me show, show it on the screen. This is the network. Okay, so the network has current word with DT, JJ, NN, and OT. Previous word with again DT, JJ, NN, and OT. And a fifth line in the this group, which is for the beginning of the sentence. Okay, so this is coming purely from the intuition that in the beginning, I need to look at the the beginning tag of the sentence. Not only that, whenever I have 
uh, a chunk which is uh, ending in one. Okay, again the same logic will apply. So you see the model driven approach now. The model driven approach is controlled by a matrix. So the current word is uh, on the columns and the previous word is on the rows. Okay, now you keep that, uh, keep the network in view. So this has DT, JJ, N, N, OT, DT, JJ, N, N, OT, four lines here, four lines here, and one beginning of the sentence line. Now, this is the model driven approach. Machine learning data driven approach will not go into those intricate details. All these will be in, <coughs> captured in the ML and data. But see the analysis. If the current word is DT, What should be the chunk? One chunk is one, zero, this is one, this is one, this is one, zero. So if the current word is a determiner, determiner, and the previous word is a hat, or rather current post tag is determiner, previous a uh, post tag is hat, then the following should happen. For DT, current word, I want uh, the output of the perceptron to be one. So the net input must exceed the threshold. The net input will be what? There will not be any feedback connection, right? There's no feedback connection. So zero into W, which is this, zero into W plus W DT, the input coming from the DT connection, DT connection, and the weight is W DT, so W DT reaches, and the previous one is uh, V hat. Okay, V hat is the weight of the connection from hat. So V is the symbol given for previous weights and W is the symbol given for current weight. So it's almost five. Okay, so this inequality should be satisfied. V hat plus W dt is greater than theta. Similarly, V hat plus W jj, which is adjective, should be greater than theta. V hat plus WNN should be greater than theta. A chunk can begin with only adjective in the beginning of the sentence. Little boys play. Boys play. This is the NN column. And others, a sentence can begin with a verb. Go and play. Okay. So then again, V hat plus WOT should be greater than theta. So all these inequalities are modeling a language phenomenon. If you took at, look at DT and JJ cell, W plus VDT plus WJJ should be less than theta. 
Why so? Because I have already seen a determiner. Now I'm seeing an adjective. The labeling has to be done for the adjective. That level should be zero because this is continuation of the chunk. The net input coming is W because DT has given a one before. W plus VDT plus WJJ should be less than theta. Then only I'll get a zero. This inequality models the language phenomenon that if you have uh, a determiner and then a, an adjective, the level should be one and zero. This is being captured by the inequality. So the whole matrix is a set of such inequalities, such of in inequalities, and it captures the language phenomena inherent in the sentence. This is called model-driven approach. No data, no training data. More interestingly, no testing data. No testing data. You, are, you have trained a network, or you have, give, okay, you have trained a network, let's say, somehow, and you see that the weights, the weights which are here, the weights which are here, they satisfy these inequalities. Then you, do, you know that the network has to uh, perform perfectly. No, no testing data. So this is what you will do in the assignment. You will run BPTT, back propagation through time. The weights which are obtained after training See if the weight values uh, conform to these inequalities. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll discuss this matrix. There are many, many beautiful things in this matrix and the problem. And since I'm not making use of any training data, I am using what is called model-driven approach. The la linguistic constraints are in my mind, and that is giving rise to these inequalities. Now I find a feasible solution for these uh, inequalities. And I see that these weights will do the job. Are these weights intuitive? Okay. So threshold is one. Uh, the feedback weight is one. Uh, v hat is one. V determiner, that is previous connections weight. Determiner, adjective, and noun have connection weights as minus two. The other OT connection has weight of one. For current word, all the weight values are one, except the OT, which is four. Okay, that is required to solve these inequalities. So we'll keep discussing this. Uh, this, this kind of constraints will have to be learned by your BPTT algorithm. The assignment will be sent very soon. Okay, you, since you have already implemented backpropagation, BPTT also is not a problem for you. Okay. So we'll keep discussing this.